Okay, so good afternoon to all of you. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the speaker today. Uh, he will say about uh, optimal programming of unitary gates, and especially when the program itself is a quantum system, as I, as I understand. Uh, this is a very interesting subject for us, or quantum computing community, since it is, I believe, related to the determination of the size of the smallest quantum program and how it scales with the accuracy. And our speaker, Julio, is the director of Quantum Information and Computation Initiative in Hong Kong University. And he's known for his pioneering works on quantum causal networks, information theoretic foundations of quantum theory, and precision limits of quantum measurements. Uh, Julio, now the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Zbicek. And thank to all the organizers for um, for for for. for for giving me the opportunity to present this work to, to this uh, audience that is very much into, into the topics I'm gonna talk about. Um, yes, I mean, the summary of the work is so good that I almost don't need to give the talk anymore because I already described very well what I'm gonna talk about, but now I will, of course, give more details and hopefully I will add some interesting things. So we'll talk about programming unitary gates. So this is joint work with Yisheng Yang who is assistant professor with me here at HKU and with Renato Renner, whom you all know from ETH. And so these all the things that I'm gonna mention today are um, contained in this work and this reference here. Okay, so let's get started with a, with a quick introduction about quantum programming. I know you are all experts, so we'll not need to, to, to spend much time on this, but just to fix a bit of common language, I will give this introduction. So as we all know, uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, unitary operators describe the possible reversible evolutions of quantum systems. So when we go to the level of quantum computers or in quantum information, we describe a computation as a sequence of unitary evolutions that are called unitary gates usually. So at least this is the ideal model of computation if we remove all the sources of errors, ideally. So we describe the computation as a sequence of unitary gates and a universal quantum computer is a, is a device that can be programmed to approximate uh, with arbitrarily uh, good accuracy every desired unitary gate. So here is like an image from Wikipedia of the typical, well, of a typical uh, quantum circuit that contains lines representing qubits in, usually, and these boxes represent unitary gates. So here, these two boxes have names, they are, they are U and W. So these are unitary gates acting on some number of qubits, and this is what the computation is supposed to be. Now, one very obvious problem is how do we program a, a, an arbitrary unitary gate? So how do we tell the computer which gate we want the computer to perform? Like how, what is the most efficient way to specify a unitary gate in a set of instructions that we can give to our computer, to our quantum device, and that our device can reliably follow so that in the end we get approximately the unitary that the unitary gate that we want. So this is the problem of programming unitary gates. Now there are two main approaches to, the, to do this. One is a classical approach and one is a quantum approach. The classical approach is the practical one, is the one that is really used nowadays uh, in the existing prototypes of quantum computers. So they are using a, a sort of classical approach to programming. So the approach is the following. You, you fix a finite set of unitary gates, a universal set, like, uh, I don't know, the gates A, Hadamard, T gate, and, um, and the, the C naught. So this would be the kind of elementary set of gates. And uh, from this elementary set, we approximate all the desired unitary gates on n qubits. Um, so the task, the classical task here is to compile a given unitary gates into a, into a circuit made only of the elementary gates. And then we would tell the computers a list of classical instructions like uh, do a C not there, do a T gate there, do a, a, a Hadamard gate there and so on. Okay, so, so in the end we would have a classical set of instructions telling the computers which gates the computer should do. And, uh, and, and, and that's the way, that's the way uh, quantum gates are programmed in, 
in nowadays uh, prototypes of quantum computers. So mathematically, this is the problem of decomposing an element of a group into, into a finite set of elementary, uh, 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 of, of elementary operations, like uh, uh, elementary gates that, that would, uh, from which we can approximate any other element. So this is not only for programming quantum gates. Here is an image from Wikipedia of um, the Euler angles, when you can decompose arbitrary rotations in three-dimensional space uh, into rotations along, uh, uh, around about, sorry, rotations about uh, uh, two or three different axes. Um, so this is a very practical approach. It's used in quantum computers and not only, it's used also in, in classical fields like robotics, when you want to, 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 to really do rotations in the physical space. So this is very practical and is very, very, well, very much used in, in, the, in the actual applications. Now, there is a quantum approach also that is a more fundamental one. It's less practical, in fact, but it's kind of more fundamentally interesting. And this is the one that I will talk about in, the, in this talk. Um, so the, the quantum approach is that instead of using a classical list of instructions, we encode the gate U into a quantum state, let's say a pure state for simplicity, a pure state uh, phi U, that would be the state of a control system, or sometimes this is called the program system. In this talk, I will call it the control system. So we will have this quantum system that contains the instruction that tell the computer which gate should be performed. And then we let the target system interact with the control system with a fixed unitary gate or with a fixed interaction that I take to be unitary for simplicity. So we have a picture like this. We have our program now is a quantum state. It's not a list of instructions. It's the quantum state of a, of a control system. The data on which we want to apply the, 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 the gate is this, the state psi of a bunch of qubits. And the way to apply the gate is to make uh, the target system interact with the control system with a big unitary gate W. And if we did uh, everything well, approximately the effective evolution of the target system should be approximately the unitary gate U that we wanted, the one that we programmed into the state phi U. Okay. So this is more fundamental, is more related to foundational questions in quantum information. But it's interesting because it contains uh, classical programming as a special case. So if we want to know what is the minimal size of a, of a program for a quantum gate, it's interesting to study the quantum approach because this contains the classical approach as a special case. I mean, whatever class sequence of classical data you had in the classical case could be encoded in the state of a quantum system. So, so this is a the classical approach is just a special case of the quantum approach. Uh, so generality and, uh, and applications in, in quantum information theory are the main motivations for studying this quantum approach. And in the end of the talk, I will discuss some of these applications. Okay, just to give you a, an example of quantum programming, just to make this a bit more concrete, imagine that you wanted to flip a spin, let's say a spin one half particle, you want to flip the spin about a given axis uh, uh, vector n, so this would be a vector in three-dimensional space, and you would like to flip the spin around that axis, whatever, whatever initial direction of the spin you have. So one strategy here would be to encode the axis of the rotation. So we want to rotate, the two, I mean, we want to flip the spin, which means we want to rotate the spin by 180 degrees uh, about this axis vector n. So we encode the information about which axis, which rotation axis we want into a quantum state uh, phi n in this case. This is quantum state of another system of a control spin. So the picture becomes, we have, uh, let's say, a spin one half particle or, or, or a certain spin, uh, a particle with a, with a certain spin that interacts with another particle with another spin. And this other particle should carry the information about the rotation axis so that when they interact together, the effective evolution is a rotation of 180 degrees of, this, of the target spin about the axis n. So one physical way to do is to create a spin-spin interaction as a, as a Heisenberg interaction, and let's say as isotropic interaction. So J target, uh, Jx with the Jx of the control, Jy of the target with the Jy of the control, 
Jx of the target with Jx of uh, Jz of the target with Jz of the control. So this kind of um, a spin spin interaction between the target and the control spin. So we can let evolve the two spins with this interaction. And we could put the initially the control spin in the coherent state and in, in a state that um, is the maximum, um, is, is the eigenvector for the maximum eigenvalue of the spin operator in the direction n. So following this, uh, this strategy, we can see how well we can program uh, the desired gate. And we find out, uh, if you do the calculations uh, carefully, you find out that uh, the overlap between the, the state that you get and the state that you would have liked uh, goes like one minus uh, uh, O of uh, J target, so the spin of the target square divided by the spin of the control. So if your control system is a big spin, uh, this error term will go to zero. So your fidelity, the overlap between the target state and the actual state goes to one. Um, this was studied uh, very carefully in this work of Moin and myself. And earlier it was done in a kind of more heuristic way by Marvian and Mann in this PRA paper. Um, so this strategy is an example of quantum programming. Um, so I see there is a question in the chat. I'm sorry, that's not... not <laughs> Not for me. All right. So this is just an example. Uh, now let's try to, to say something general about this problem of programming unitary gates. The first general result is a no-go theorem by Nielsen and Chuang back in 1997. It's sometimes called the no programming theorem, uh, although this name may be a bit misleading. I mean, uh, apologies for, <laughs> for using this name. So the, the, what the theorem says, the no programming theorem says that the, you can, if you want to do exact programming of an infinite set of unitary gates, so if you have, uh, like, say, let's say, all possible rotations of a spin, or, or um, so if you want to do it exactly, you need an infinite dimensional control system. So it's not really a no go theorem, but it's, it's a no go theorem if you want to do this in finite dimensions, but it's actually a theorem that says that in principle you could do it in, 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 in infinite dimensions. Although, I mean, there are still difficulties at, at, even at that level. But the point here is that you cannot do programming with a finite amount of resources. And if you think that the dimension is kind of related to the amount of energy also that you would uh, invest into, into your system, infinite dimension means also unbounded energy in most physical systems that we are familiar with. So given that there is this no-go theorem for exact programming, a natural question is like, how well can we do if we want to have an approximate uh, programming? Um, and precisely the question becomes, what is the minimum dimension that you need for your control system if you want to achieve a, a desired level of accuracy, a desired level of precision, so a finite level of precision, but for, for every level of precision, you can ask, what is the minimum amount of dimension that I need in order to reach this precision? So this problem has been studied a lot uh, for more than two decades. So after Nissen and Chuang, there has been a sequence of works uh, by different authors uh, giving slightly different names uh, to the task they were studying, but basically is always the same question. So what is the best encoding of a given gate uh, into, into, a, into the state of a quantum system? Um, this is a partial list of references. There are more and, and even more recent works on this. Um, this problem has been studied so much because it is important for the quantification of different types of resources uh, in quantum information processing. It's related to the problem of quantum reference frames, uh, is related to problems in error correction, uh, and, and many other things. So, so this is why many people have been interested in studying this problem. Uh, still, the, the finding the optimal relation between the dimension of the control system and the level of accuracy has remained as an open problem uh, for a long time. And basically, the point of this talk is to give you the asymptotic solution of that problem. Um, so what do I mean by asymptotic? I mean that uh, we will look uh, of how the dimension of the control system scales with the, the, with the error, with the accuracy that we want to reach. So I will uh, look at the accuracy epsilon, like the error, as my asymptotic parameter. So I want the error epsilon to go to zero. And I want to see how the dimension of the control system grows uh, 
uh, when epsilon goes to zero. So I will look uh, at the leading term in the variable one over epsilon, and I will neglect uh, all the other terms. So uh, as long as we are happy to look at this uh, leading order term, uh, the, the problem, the, the paper that we have give the exact solution. So we find that the, the dimension of the control system, if you take the, the log, the logarithm in base two of the dimension, which tells you the number of qubits you need in your program. So this log grows exactly like this. It's like a log two of one over epsilon times the dimension of the target system minus one divided by two. So this, this constant is the exact constant for the leading order term in one over epsilon. And the leading order term is log of one over epsilon. So this is really the main, the main result. And um, in the rest of the talk, I will tell you a bit about the intuition and the techniques that went into the derivation of this result. But, uh, but this is it. I mean, this formula is the main point of the whole paper. Uh, so if you want to program an arbitrary unitary gate in the unitary group SUD, for if you want to, to do this on the target, the optimal uh, scaling with the precision is this, is d, d target uh, uh, square minus one over two times log of epsilon in base two. And this gives you the minimum number of qubits you need in the program. All right, so this is the, the, the main result and is the point where I want to get. So now let me give you, um, well, let me give you first a bit of comparison with the previous results uh, um, that, that were there. So before in previous works, we had the upper bounds on the size of the program, again, on, on the, the number of qubits you need in the program. Uh, so there, were, uh, there was this upper bound that was also scaling by the log, uh, log of one over epsilon. This was due by Kubitsky, Palazuelos, and Perez Garcia um, 2019. So this was the, uh, yeah, the best upper bounds in terms of one over epsilon that we had before. And the uh, lower bounds also, you see, we also had the lower bound going like um, uh, one over epsilon with a different constant. Plus we had other bounds like a bound from porous based teleportation that had a one over, over epsilon squared dependence and other bounds, um, uh, lower bounds and of a kind of linear kind. So what we get in our work uh, pres more precisely is this result. We have an upper bound that is d square minus one over two. So d here is the dimension of the target log of one over epsilon. And the lower bound is the same thing, but the constant is d squared minus one over two minus delta, where delta is any finite uh, uh, positive number. So basically it's like, <laughs> as if morally, it is like you can take delta equal to zero here and the two, and the two constants match, match each other exactly. Uh, to be more precise, you have this minus delta where delta is an arbitrarily small constant independent of epsilon. Um, all right, so now let me go a little bit to the, to the methods and to the ideas that went uh, into this result. Uh, first, I will give you the methods uh, for the lower bound. Like how do we lower bound the number of qubits uh, needed uh, to, to achieve a desired level of precision? Um, the starting point, interestingly enough, was a result in quantum foundations, actually a result about general probabilistic theories. So nothing to do with quantum, well, with <laughs> nothing to do with the Hilbert space framework. It was a, um, a result about um, how you can try to prove the theorem by Nielsen and Chuang, the no programming theorem, only based on some axioms. So this was a, a, a very, how can I say, <laughs> Uh, high level derivation, but the interesting thing of that foundational work is that uh, we were forced to find an alternative technique uh, that was different from the one used by Nielsen and Chuang in their original proof of the no programming theorem. And the technique, if we translate it in the quant back into the quantum language, it tells you this, uh, this fact number one, that if you can program a gate, a unitary gate without any error, so with zero error, then you conclude that the state of the control system, the state that you use to program the gate U, can also be used to implement the gate U tensor U dagger for arbitrarily many repetitions. So if you can program the gate U without any errors, then you can get U U dagger as many times as you like, uh, always with zero error. And the scheme that does it is shown here. 
So you see the basic building block is the one that, you, that allows you to program exactly the gate U. So if you can program exactly the gate U, you will start with this program phi U at the beginning. After an interaction, you will get a new state of the program. And the interesting thing is that that new state can be used to program exactly the gate U dagger. And what you get afterwards is again the program U, uh, phi U for programming U. So you get U, U dagger, U, U dagger, U, U dagger, and so on <laughs> forever, for as many times as you like. Um, and the consequence of this is that if you have two distinct programs for two distinct uh, gates, uh, U and U prime, then these two programs can be distinguished from each other with arbitrary precision, because you can basically you can amplify the effect of this program by producing as many copies of U tensor U dagger as you like. And so this allows you to distinguish. So this is a very complicated or a very convoluted way to distinguish the state uh, uh, phi U and phi U prime if you have two, prog two exact programs. So in this way, you retrieve the original result by Nissen and Chuang by this uh, maybe more complicated proof, but on the other hand, more operational proof because it shows you um, instead of going just through the mathematics, it gives you like a, a kind of a physical procedure that, that, that tells you why this, um, why this program states must be orthogonal and distinguishable from each other. Most importantly, oh. uh, yes. So Julio, can I ask, so I, yes. it's not clear for me why uh, after the first round of the protocol, like when let's say uh, you, you follow the red arrow, uh, mm -hmm. You know, you and you apply this uh, W dagger. This will be implementing U dagger. Like yes, I mean, it's, uh, is it kind of? In, it's not, it's not obvious. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not the difficult, but it's not obvious. Maybe I mean you wouldn't see it. Maybe it on the spot, but maybe in half an hour, if you try, you could you can do it. Let me give you a hint of how does this work. You see the the first blue arrows. So this implements a unitary gate U. A unitary gate is a pure operation. No? So if you apply if you apply this instead of psi one, I put a maximally entangled state here. I get a, a tripartite state here where the marginal is pure. So whenever a state is pure, and you have a, 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 and, the, and you can think of that pure state as a marginal of, of a state like the one where you remove the red uh, red red system. Well, the only way that you can have a pure state as a marginal is that if the original state uh, was a product. So this tells you that what, what you get here for on the red arrow is uh, some new pure state. Uh, let's say it, uh, let's call it uh, phi u tilde. Okay. So are you with me so far? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So now, so, so what you know now is that if you apply the gate w to any psi uh, tensor phi u, you get uh, you apply the to psi one uh, tensor uh, psi u tilde, all right? But if you apply u dagger on both sides and u on both sides, you get uh, the second equality. You get that applying uh, uh, w dagger to to psi u tilde and any state uh, psi two would give you u dagger and 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 the psi psi u back. This is just by multiplying on the left and on the right by w dagger and u dagger. And that's the right. So, so like the, the key thing is kind of this realization that uh, you must have, let's say, factorization between, let's say, the red parts and the blue yes. parts. Yes. After. yes. Yes. Thank you. This is really the key point. And basically, it follows from the purification property of quantum theory. So that's why we, we stumbled on, uh, on this alternative proof of the no programming theory in this paper that is a paper completely about. Uh, general probabilistic theories without Hilbert spaces. The title of the, the paper is probabilistic theories with purification. So every theory with purification uh, that has kind of, that satisfies the purification axiom would give, would allow you to, to run this proof. And it will allow you to show that every time you can program reversible gates, the program states must be, perf must be perfectly distinguishable. Uh, right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So this helps me to get to the next step. I mean, because I mean, why is this alternative proof useful? Because this proof suggests you also a way to, to do approximate programming. This result that we had in the foundational paper was a result is for exact programming without any error. 
But now you can try to do the same things by putting an error epsilon. And uh, of course, for this, we go to the quantum level. We abandon the, the, the sky of foundations. So we go down to Earth and start doing things with the Hilbert spaces. So the second important result here is the continuity of the Stein spring dilation. So this fact uh, is, is a very classic result by now in, in quantum information is this uh, result by, uh, by Kretschmann, Schlingemann, and Werner in Journal of Functional Ana Analysis. This tells you that um, whenever you have two quantum evolutions, like two quantum channels, two completely positive trace preserving maps, and these two quantum channels are epsilon close to each other with respect to the, to the right distance, which is the, the diamond norm, also called the completely bounded trace distance. So whenever the two channels uh, are close, are, are epsilon close to each other, then every time you take a Stein spring dilation of one of the two channels, uh, this, there will be another Stein spring dilation of the other channel that is uh, square root of epsilon close times some constant that. Uh, that I'm not entirely sure I'm getting right here. I don't remember if it was two or two root two or root two epsilon. But anyway, it's the square root of epsilon scaling. So here is a picture of the result. So if you have two channels, E1 and E2, that are epsilon close to each other, when you go to the level of Stein spring dilations of this channel, so that the, the isometry that implements these channels, uh, you can always find the two Stein spring dilations that are root epsilon close to each other times a constant, which hopefully is two. If I, if I put the right constants here, okay? So this allows to, do, to epsilonize the argument that we were discussing in the previous slide. This factorization of the control with the target, it becomes an approximate factorization. And this point, so in the case when one of the two channels is a unitary gate U, uh, so we can think of this realization with um, the, the interaction as the Stein spring dilation. And um, so, so this time spring dilation would tell you that uh, you, 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 this, this should be close to a time spring dilation of the original gate. And the time spring dilation of the original gate is just to put a, a, a state of, of the control system. So it tells you that uh, your original scheme where there is an interaction between the target and the control system is equivalent to just applying a unitary gate on the target uh, and tensoring this with some other state uh, phi u prime of the control up to an error square root of epsilon times a constant. And as we were saying uh, right now with Michael, if you multiply on both sides by u dagger and w dagger, you get this other equation. Tells you again that the, the distance uh, between uh, this diagram with the w dagger and uh, a realization of the gate u dagger with the fixed state that psi u here is approximately square root of two epsilon. So this argument where one of the two evolutions is noiseless was made by Kretschmann, Krebs, and Speckens in this PRA paper, uh, exactly where they discuss the trade-off between the noiselessness of a channel and, uh, and the lack of information that goes to the other channel, like the constancy of the other channel. So if the blue channel is the channel for the blue part is unitary, the channel for the rest, uh, for the red part should be kind of independent of the input on the blue part, should be a constant like, like a, as we have here. So this technique has been used in many other works and recently uh, was re used in a, in a context that is similar to our in this paper uh, by Ta Tajima, Shirash, Sh Shiraishi and Saito. And, and then there is a sequence of works that, that build on this. But uh, ba basically, it is always the continuity of the Stein spring dilation. Um, so when we apply this continuity of the Stein spring dilation to our own problem, we find out the analog of the, of the alternative proof of not programming that we had before. So the, the epsilon version is like this. If you can program a gate U uh, with error epsilon, with a finite amount of error epsilon, then the state of the control system that you can use for programming can also be used to implement uh, M repetitions of the gate U tensor U dagger now with an error that grows like 4m square root of epsilon. Because of course, every time uh, that you use that uh, approximate equality, you accumulate error, uh, error uh, square root of epsilon. So if you do it for m times, you get something that grows like m times the square root of epsilon. Uh, so what does it tell you now about the program? It tells you that the information that you can, uh, roughly speaking, the information that you have in the original 
program, phi u, should be approximately equal to the information that you can extract from the gate u tensor u dagger to the power m. As long as you keep the error term small enough, up to this error term, you get that the amount of information about the gate u that you have in the program should be approximately the same amount of information you get from u tensor u dagger for m times, as long as m square root of epsilon is small enough. So now we are in business because we, we, we get to the point that we can really get a quantitative bound. So the third factor that we use is, is a very well-known fact in quantum information is the Holevo bound. Uh, here I use the Holevo bound for pure states. So you say that if a set of pure states in a Hilbert space of dimension D, so for every state set of pure states in a Hilbert space of dimension D, and for every probability distribution over this of the, this state, the log of the dimension of the space must be larger than the von Neumann entropy of the average state. So this is the special case of the Hollywood bound for pure states. The average state, I average the density matrix of this pure state with respect to my probability distribution. So for every probability distribution I pick, this will give me a bound on the, on the dimension of the system that, that, is, that is supporting these states uh, uh, phi u. So basically, if you use this idea in our context, we get that, that up to all the approximation error, this is the square root of epsilon times m, the log dimension of the control system, so the number of qubits in the control system, should be larger than the maximum entropy of uh, any set of states that we can generate from the gate uh, u tensor u dagger tensor m. So whatever pure states we can generate by applying this, this gate will have a certain amount of Holevo information of phenomenon entropy of the, of, the, of the average state. And this is a lower bound to the dimension of the program. So um, now, of course- Sorry, so sorry Julia, just, uh, I got lost in this basically last sentence or last two sentences. How you, can, can, can you explain again how you move from this level bound to how you associate, because uh, I know we have this, uh, let's say program state, right yes. on one uh, and on the other hand we have maybe some possible states that we can get by applying this u times u dagger uh, yes. and yes. for time so i got those in this connection can you just elaborate a bit more like how we get i mean all this is a bit hand waving because i'm just giving the intuition without doing the formal steps but the argument is this if you have if you give me the program state psi u I can approximately get, get the gate u tensor u dagger for m times, approximately. Let's pretend that I do it almost perfectly. So as long as I can keep the error under control, I can get this gate out of, your, of the program that you give me. Now, from this gate, I can try to estimate the gate u. How do I estimate the gate u? I would apply the gate u tensor u dagger tensor m to some, some big entangled state. I would prepare a huge entangled state. I will let the gate U tensor U dagger tensor M uh, act on it, and I will get some set of states out of it, okay? So now the whole level information this, of this set of states that I get should be larger up to approximation error than the original whole level, sorry, should be, sorry, should, should not larger, sorry. <laughs> should be, it cannot be, cannot be larger than the original whole level information of the program. No, because the, because the whole level information is monotone, is monotonic under, under oper physical, under quantum channels. So all this sequence of operations that I do is just a big quantum channel that transforms uh, the original program state phi u into a new set of states, into a new state, okay? So the whole level information of the original ensemble, of the ensemble of the program states uh, should be larger then, then the whole level information of the output ensemble, which is approximately the one that I generate from this U tensor U dagger tensor M. Of course, the devil is the approximation error in this. One has to keep that under control, but we have done that job. So, so then, then what, that's why I feel entitled to speak a little bit in a hand-waving way, because eventually this, uh, this argument does work as long as if you do a, a clean job in taking into account the approximation error. Right. Does this answer your question? Uh, sure, perfect, many thanks. Yeah. All right, thanks.
Okay, so now, now we need this, a bit of heavy duty techniques to actually do these calculations. So we use the, of course, the Schurweil duality, which is basically the, 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 the hammer that we use whenever we have the a unitary gate U tensor M. Um, so this, this uh, so to compute this von Neumann entropy of, this, of the average state generated by U tensor U dagger tensor M, we can use the Schurweil duality where, uh, the Hilbert space of M copies of a d-dimensional system is decomposed into this direct sum of products of uh, spaces where the irreducible representation act and, sp and multiplicity spaces where there is no, no action of SU, of SUD. So these, these, are, these terms in the direct sum are labeled by Young diagrams. So these are diagrams of M boxes with at most D rows. Um, so the maximum entropy that you can generate by applying unitary gates to, 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 to pure states was computed earlier on in a paper of my co-authors and I on quantum estimation is the logarithm of the sum over, uh, of sum over lambda of the dimension square of this representation spaces. So if you are familiar with the representation theory, this is a, a quantity that you might have seen other times, if you are not, uh, never mind. It's not so important now. This is just, just to advertise the techniques we used. Now, this sum of the squared dimensions of the representation spaces is a classical quantity considered already by Schur himself. And Schur uh, proved, in, in, if I remember correctly, in his PhD thesis, uh, proved this formula that the sum of the dimension squares over all possible Yam diagram is given by this binomial coefficient. So after all, this becomes a pretty simple combinatorial quantity. And this is what we used. So if you, now, now I will skip the technical details at this point. If you put all these this, this results together and if you are careful with the approximation error, you obtain a, a lower bound. Uh, actually, I should not write an asymptotic lower bound. This is a lower bound that is always true. So this is not asymptotic. This is the bound. You get this lower bound that depends uh, uh, on, on epsilon, on D, and, 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 and constants. And also this constant de delta that is every fixed constant uh, larger than zero independent of epsilon. Okay. So we get this bound, this bound is always true, um, is always true for also for finite, uh, for finite epsilon. Now, if you want to go asymptotic, you consider the leading term in one over epsilon and the leading term is a log two of one over epsilon. So you get this lower bound, you get that uh, the number of qubits in the control system is lower bounded by one minus delta d squared minus one over two uh, log, uh, log of one over epsilon, where delta is any fixed content, constant you like. So uh, it cannot be exactly zero, but it can be as close to zero as you like. So this argument gives you a lower bound. Now let's go to the upper bound. To, the upper, to consider the upper bound, we construct an explicit way uh, to, 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 uh, to, to do programming. So we have a, a, an explicit programming method. That is, the idea is that um, to generate a program, we use again a group representation. So imagine you want to program the gate U, um, you pick a, a representation of the unitary group. So R of U is a new unitary gate that represents the gate U. And you let this representation R of U act on some fixed state. So in this way, you generate a family of states that will depend on the, on the unitary gate U through this representation R of U. So this, this is a possible ansatz for our, for our um, program states. Uh, so this is a physical way to generate a, your program state from a representation of, of the unitary group. Uh, so this R U. So you start from a fixed state, apply this unitary gate R of U, and you will get an output state that is your program. So a priori, there is no guarantee that this is the best way to do quantum programming, but still it is a reasonable way to get started. And this is how we got started. We picked a specific representation of the gate U and we, and we saw how well we could do with that. Now, after you have the program state, again, you needed to specify how you extract the gate from the program state. So what kind of interaction you use when you make the control system interact with the target. 
And here we use the, uh, again, a very basic idea. The idea is that we simply perform a measurement on the control system. We try to basically to estimate what the, what the gate u, u is from, uh, from, from the state psi, phi u. And then based on the outcome of our measurement, we perform a unitary gate on the target system. So the idea is to basically to approximate this, um, to create an interaction that is of the measurement type. So we first measure the program state, phi u. We measure the control system. The measurement will give us an outcome i. And from the outcome i, we will decide to perform a unitary gate ui on the target system. And the target system will come out here. So I call this a measure and operate strategy. So you measure the control system and you operate on the target. Again, there is no guarantee that this is the best way to do programming, but again, we use this as, as an ansatz to get started. Uh, now, specifically, which representation we used? Uh, technically, we used a, a truncated regular representation. So you picked, we picked uh, all the Yam diagram up to uh, of a certain size. Uh, so with a finite number of, of boxes, uh, we picked all of them. So you picked the representation space tensor identity on a multiplicity space of the same dimension as the representation space. So technically, this is like uh, obtained from the regular representation of the group by truncating uh, to a finite uh, number of Yam diagrams. So here we picked uh, all the Yam diagrams with a fixed number n of boxes. Um, and for the input states, we chose states of the that are direct sums of maximally entangled states for every sector, for every Young diagram lambda. Uh, and the coefficients are just given by some probability distribution. So we have to optimize the coefficient here. Uh, but the form of the state is fixed. And these states are were already known to be optimal for the estimation of the gate U. So if you want to estimate the gate U from n copies, uh, the optimal states would have this form, and this was established uh, basically in, in my PhD a long time ago uh, in this work here. Okay, now I, I skip the, all the technical details. If you do all these things, if you pick this particular representation and those particular states uh, and, and also the right coefficients, you can prove this, uh, this, um, this upper bound on the error. You say that uh, the estimation, the precision of, of the, for the estimation of, of the gate U from the program state, uh, goes like this, like this expression, uh, when you can see the, ta the square of one over the target dimension. And uh, so this is the error, this is an upper bound on the error, and the dimension of the, of, the, of, the, of the control system that we are using here, the dimension of this representation space is upper bounded by this other expression. Now, if you, uh, so this result is already interesting, even independently of the problem of programming, because it improves on the best existing result on, um, on the estimation of a unitary gate in SUD. So up to now, the best result was this work by Jonas Kahn, uh, dating back to 2007, where um, basically Kahn proved that you can achieve the, uh, you can achieve Eisenberg limit for the estimations, it's one over n squared. But the constant was computed only numerically. Now here we have an improvement because we have an explicit analytical, ex analytical expression for, for the constant. And using this expression, we can relate the error with the dimension of the program. And we can obtain eventually this upper bound on the, on the log dimension of the, of the control system. So on the size of the pro the number of qubits in the program. Again, this upper bound is non-asymptotic, is exact upper bound. But if you want to take uh, only the asymptotic, the leading order in, in one over epsilon, this is this log of one over epsilon term with this constant. So eventually you find that this asymptotic upper bound matches the asymptotic lower bound that, that we had before. So if you only care about the leading order in one over epsilon, the leading order is log of one over epsilon and the constant is the same up to that delta that we discussed before. Okay, so that's all. If I have... Um, a few more minutes I can make a bit of discussion or if you prefer to conclude the talk and discuss later, I can jump to the conclusion now. And what, what do you guys prefer? Well, I think I, you can have a discussion right now and then we can proceed with questions. All right. 
So uh, let me. Can I, know, can I just ask about this last result that you showed? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Go on. Go uh, on. So I mean, maybe you you were about to comment about it, but okay. What what seems interesting to to me uh, from what, what I see is that uh, okay, you seem to okay, you you circumvent with this protocol kind of the naive strategy that would be based just on doing let's say some let's say epsilon packing uh, or epsilon covering argument right that would give you basically the results you know you can basically uh uh yeah construct like a net or like a, yes yes, uh, yes let's say packing kind of packing in the space of unitaries and basically you have a similar scaling with the dimension of the target and the epsilon but you won't have divided by d right it would be like uh d squared minus one log um, I, I will get to that i will get to that okay I will get to that in a, in a cup. yeah but that, that's a very good point i mean actually that's not a naive strategy because constructing this this net for for sud requires some skills some pretty advanced skills but this was done luckily by others so we didn't have to do the work by ourselves and um yes I can anticipate that we get a, an advantage over that by a factor two, but I, I will talk about this in a minute. Okay, uh, sorry, please. Yeah. Okay, no, well, no need to be sorry. Thanks, actually. This is this preparing the. Okay, there is one thing I wanted to mention first. I will be maybe quicker on this. Is the relation with the problem of learning a unitary gate? So that's a, a different operational task. So learning a gate, roughly speaking, is this task. Is the task of um, where you want to learn how to perform an unknown unitary gate U by querying the corresponding black box. So let's say you enter in a lab, there is a black box that performs some unitary gate U, and you don't know which, which gate is that, but you are allowed to use this black box for a number of times, for a finite number of times. After that, somebody will enter in the lab, will take the black box away from you, and we'll test how well you have learned. They will ask you, now, can you do it by yourself? Can you implement the same gate that, 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 uh, that you had in the lab now by yourself? Can you rebuild the same gate? So what is the best way to do it? So this problem, uh, and this was introduced in this work by Bizio and, and others. I'm one of the others, but in this as well. And um, the best, the most general strategy that you can use, um, at least in quantum theory, in standard quantum theory, is this, is that when you can use the gate U in the lab, you would apply it on some, in general, on some bipartite state phi, you apply one time, then you apply some, some fixed unitary operation on all the systems you have, then you apply it another time, then you apply another unitary operation, and then you apply the gate U another time. So you keep querying the gate U for a few times, and you, and you apply your own global operations, the ones in green, Eventually, what you get is the state of a quantum system, which may be even a multipartite system, like whatever it is, you just regard this as a single block, as a single quantum system. This is like a program, is a state that depends on the gate U. So this phase is like the storage phase, where you have the black box U in the lab, you are allowed to use it in any circuit you like, and you store the information about U into, into the state of a program. Then this gate is taken out from your lab and you only remain with the program and uh, you have to try to execute the gate. So the execution phase is a bit like the programming part where you use uh, your program for you in some interaction with the target system and you try to extract the, the unknown gate you out of your program. So this is the problem of gate learning. In a certain sense, it's a special type of programming where the program has to be physically generated by applying the unitary gate. So it's not that uh, on pe with pen and paper, you, you engineer which program state you want and then you prepare it. No, you have to generate the program by physically applying the black box. So that's the difference between learning and programming. Um, so in th that paper by Bizio et al showed that, that um, when the unknown gates are picked from a group, the optimal storing strategy is to apply the gates in parallel on some entangled state. And the optimal execution strategy is just to estimate what the gate is uh, and to use a measure and operate strategy. So if you combine this, this result with our result, you get that basically the optimal universal programming of unitary gates coincides with the optimal universal gate learning. 
So this, these two tasks are operationally equivalent. The best way to do programming is actually to do learning, to generate the program state from the black box itself. Uh, if you put everything together, we get uh, basically that uh, the optimal gate programming is the same as the optimal gate learning, which is the same as the estimation of the gate. So the optimal programs can be generated physically by applying the gate uh, for n times uh, on, some, uh, on, on some, some fixed input state by applying the gate in parallel and then by doing some global operation. And the optimal interaction is just to estimate the gate. So we, are, we literally use the kind of the quantum metrology strategy, try to estimate the gate, and you just execute the gate that you estimated. So the, the, all these three tasks are fundamentally equivalent to each other. So that was comment number one. Comment number two is the one that Michael was mentioning about the sort of quantum advantage in programming. Uh, simple case where I think everybody has an intuition. Imagine that you want to program a, a phase shift where you rotate by around the given axis by an angle uh, theta that goes from zero to two pi. The classical strategy, the naive classical strategy, which is actually also the best classical strategy is to divide, to discretize the circle, to discretize your angle. So let's say you divide into, into, into D uh, the discrete uh, area uh, intervals. Uh, you, you divide the, the circle into d, d, d in t integral. If you compute the error, you find that at leading order, the, the, the classical error is like is going like pi over two dimension of the control system, which is also the dimension of the discrete the number of intervals in the discretization. No? You just write down classically in a bunch of orthogonal states uh, which interval you are in. So in the worst case, the error goes like this. Now, if you compare this with the classical approach that we regenerated the program state from, from n uses of the, of, the, of the gate u theta, and by doing phase estimation, you find that there is this kind of Heisenberg scaling. So you get a quantum error that goes like a pi square over two dimension square at the leading order. So this square here is basically the Heisenberg limit. You can see here that there is a better dependence of the error on the dimension. So if you look in terms of number of qubits, the number of qubits classically grows like log of one over epsilon. And in the quant with the quantum strategy is one half of that, one half log of one over epsilon. Okay, so this was it for the simple case of just a one parameter family of gates. So if you want to do something more difficult, if you want to program arbitrary unitary gates, you would have a kind of uh, discretize the SUD groups uh, group into, into, into sort of mesh. So this is technically very non-trivial, in fact. Uh, and it was done by Kubitsky, Palazuelos, and Perez Garcia in this previous work. So what they found is that with the mesh that they can construct, they get that uh, the number of qubits in the control system grows like um, d squared times logarithm of one, of one over epsilon at the leading order. So you can compare this with the result that I just showed to you, that is um, number of qubits growing like d squared minus one over two log of one over epsilon. So again, is a similar uh, situation to the one we had in the previous slide. The quantum strategy allows you to improve by a factor two uh, compared to the classical strategy. Here is a bit better than a factor two, but basically what, uh, what, uh, what we conjecture is that in general, if you take the optimal classical strategy and the optimal quantum strategy, there is a quantum advantage by a factor two in the number of qubits uh, that, that you need to achieve for a fixed uh, uh, desired amount of accuracy. All right, so that's all. Uh, in summary, there is a, the key result of our paper is that we have this um, asymptotic solution of the quantum programming problem for, for unitary gates in SUD. So the number of qubits grows like log of one over epsilon and the constant is exactly d squared minus one over two for, for SUD. Uh, now the big open problem here, there are many open problems and many interesting directions, but the one that, for, that is nagging me the most is this, that from all the examples uh, we know, not only this, we can see that there is this sort of universal law that says that the, dimension, the number of qubits in the control should grow like the number of parameters in our manifold of, of unitary gates divided by two log of one over epsilon at the leading order in, in one over epsilon. Um, 
the example of phase estimation I showed to you is, is also an example because you have a, the number of pa free parameters is one, is just one phase, and you get exactly one half log of one over epsilon. If you look back at the beginning of my talk, that example of flipping a spin uh, by, an ang or by, by a 180 degrees about uh, an arbitrary axis in space, again, the direction of an axis is given by two parameters, by, by the two, two angles uh, that, <laughs> that specify a direction. And in that case, you, you get exactly the scaling log of one over epsilon. So all the examples that I know actually kind of comply with this conjecture that uh, asymptotically, the, the number of qubits you need is the number of free parameters in your manifold of unitary gates divided by two log of one over epsilon. All right, so that's all for my talk. Thank you very much for uh, your attention with the questions already during the talk and looking forward to, to, the, to the discussion now. Okay, thank you very much. So are there any questions? Well, I have a, so, a, maybe a simple one. Sorry, I, uh, just because I didn't know you wanted to start. Uh, I, I, hello? Uh, yes, so I have. So I had a question. Like, uh, okay. uh, so, uh, have you considered the situation when we don't only consider unitary gates but uh, general channels? What uh, What will be the difficulties we may face? Um, I have thought about this, and um, uh, I must say. Um, uh, yes, I have thought about this. Uh, of course, channels are much harder. Um, um, channels are much harder to treat uh, because, um, well, basically, they are like the difference between channels and, and unitary is a bit like the difference between mixed states and pure states. So the question is that um, in our work, we used a lot the fidelity, and for channels, um, well, the fidelity already is a, is a difficult quantity. You could try to use the diamond norm. For, for, for unitary gates, there was an easy relation between fidelity and diamond norm. For channels, everything becomes more difficult. So I am skeptical uh, after working on this a little bit, and I, am, I should apologize with my co-authors for like, like not having <laughs> completed our works yet. We, we do have some results. Um, uh, but um, uh, but uh, but yes, um, uh, uh, but uh, but yes. So the difficulty there is that it's very difficult to have really the optimal solution. However, one can find the good heuristics, um, and uh, and um, and yes. So uh one can one can get some good heuristics and maybe even be able to prove a quantum advantage there as well but uh, finding a general solution for arbitrary channels is not something that i hope to be able to do myself i know there are smarter people that maybe will be able to do it so but but, but i know it, it is it is a pretty hard problem if you want to do it for arbitrary channels there are milder generalizations that one can try to do for example um, Instead of unitaries, maybe what about arbitrary isometries? I know there are recent works by Mio Murao on doing optimal operations on, uh, and, and Mio Murao and her group, of course, uh, uh, doing optimal operations on isometries. Uh, so this might be tractable, and there are interesting things to say. It is not that for isometries, not that everything is the same as unitaries. But of course, isometries like unitaries are pure operations, so are a bit of an idealized case. I think the next in line would be the case of von Neumann measurements. So like channels mm -hmm. uh, that do the coherence in a given basis. And I know that uh, uh, many people who are here in the audience are, are actually interested in related problems to learning of measurements. Uh, Michael was mentioning this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably the next uh, uh, nearly tractable case. Maybe again, finding the optimal solution is, is a bit maybe too optimistic, but uh, maybe one can have good, op good bounds and, and, and already prove interesting things like advantages be, uh, of the quantum strategy over the classical strategy, for example. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that answer. OK, I have a question about, because you probably know about this paper by Mario Zimand and Alessandro Bisi about probabilistic learning of unitary gates. 
uh, is it possible to have something like probabilistic programming? So Correct. you execute a program. Yes. So sometimes you fail, sometimes you don't. But yes. actually, if you, if you do succeed, then you yes. Can you comment on that? Sorry, let me go back for a second to the to the previous question. When I said that I need to apologize to my co-authors, I mean uh, I need to apologize to. To my co-author Michael Stutzinski, which is like many of you know, but who has been doing a lot of this stuff um, when we, that we discussed together for for learning of channels. And I mean, unfortunately, this project has been going slow due to me. So I, that's the apology I wanted to to do. And and, and okay, and and that's and that, and that's the and that's it. So regarding your question about um, about probabilistic programming, um, of course, this is an important and, and very interesting problem. Um, we haven't tried to do anything significant yet on that side. Of course, uh, our work gives some, uh, some lower bounds on probabilistic, sorry, some, uh, some lower bounds, no? Because uh, if you have a probabilistic exact programming scheme, you can convert that probabilistic exact programming scheme into an approximate uh, deterministic scheme that would be subject to the bounds, the, 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 to the lower bounds that we have here. Of course, uh, the problem is that uh, for probabilistic programming, uh, I mean, the, the, if you want to do it, to do exact programming is a much more uh, uh, stringent condition. So perhaps the scaling becomes really different. Instead of having the sort of Heisenberg scaling that we got here, you are forced to a sort to a sort of standard quantum limit scaling because you are res requiring a very restricting co condition that you you want exactly zero error. Um, so so in moral of the story is that I believe that if you want really to know the exact scaling for probabilistic programming, our work is no good then, and you really need to, to do it basically from scratch. Uh, maybe you can use a similar techniques. And but uh, but the work is is completely to be done if you want to to answer the same question as our question, but now in terms of probability of success versus dimension of the of the of the program of the control system, this is genuinely work that has to be done. And in this, uh, I, uh, I haven't even tried here, except for the okay. obvious bound that, that comes from 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 the paper that that we have. Okay, thank you very much. I think it is very interesting because uh, in terms of learning, it is already done for linear matrices. Uh, so maybe it, it, should be, it should be possible to obtain programming bounds uh, in this probabilistic case. Okay, uh, are there any other questions? I have some questions, but... Uh... Oh, okay. I, I did ask a few, so maybe if other people have, have so. Please go ahead, David, because I don't hear uh, anyone else. Right, so uh, I was wondering, uh, okay, like how, how like in this, uh, yeah, in, the, uh, in this programming, like how complex, uh, uh, how complex is the operation that you need to perform to, to run this program, how complex is this W in, in your protocol, right? Because you have, a, a, you know, let's think that this unitary act, uh, I'm talking complex in a sense of computational complexity. Is it uh, like feasible to construct or, I mean, okay, feasible. I know the, the, the dimensions on, on which those things act, they are massive, but like, yeah. Um. I mean, this is a good point. I will give you a kind of theoretician's answer. Although, I mean, we haven't worked out the details explicitly. So, so take what I say with a pinch of salt. But so, so what do we need to do in, in, our, in, our, um, in our protocol? So we need to apply the gates. Uh, so we need, so the gates uh, presumably are gates that, the gate U, if you want to apply it n times, this counts as one query. I mean, this is a gate that you are provided. Now, what you do around the gate is to do the sure transform. So Aram Harrow showed that the sure transform can be done efficiently in the sense of right. polynomially in the, the number of, um, of qubits that you have and in the, the approximation parameter, because you, I mean, you don't really realize the sure transform exactly. You realize sure. an approximation of the sure transform. 
So this can be done efficiently in terms of the approximation parameter and in terms of the um, uh, and in terms of uh, of the of the number of qubits. The next thing you need to do is to do this estimation, which is basically again <laughs> applying. Uh, I mean, if you really want to do estimation in a sort of practical or theoretician practical way, how would you do that? I mean, in the paper, we have a continuous outcome measurement and all. So if you want to do it practically, you would pick a T design, like a, 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 whatever it is here is, a, we have N qubits, so it's like two N or N, uh, N, N star <laughs> uh, complex design. You would pick, pick this discretization and, and implement the gates in the discretization. So you, you realize your measurement. Uh, um, so how costly is that again? Uh, but okay, but uh, like maybe okay, uh, like it, it will be in the end polynomial in the dimension of the system, I suspect. Yes, of course. Right. Uh, I mean, this is uh, efficient in the theoretician sense because sure. there is nothing practical really here. Um, it's not, I mean, this is not meant to be implemented <laughs> basically as it is. Of but, uh, but somehow, if one wants to push it forward, uh, uh, yes, is, uh, I mean, the question is also like how to implement uh, on a quantum computer this optimal measurements uh, of course. that estimate a unitary gate. And uh, I mean, in the end, I think this can be done polynomially after you do all the, the T design, the realization of the P of EM uh, as, 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 as um, uh, with an IMARC extension and all of these things. So eventually everything will be polynomial, but of course the question is, can we make it reasonable as a polynomial, no? not a polynomial with a huge, uh, with a huge exponent? Right. So, uh, what is the exponent? I don't know. So this is. Um... Uh, can I ask one very quick question? Um, yes. So do you have a physical intuition behind this uh, quantum advantage of a half having the number of qubits, or, or is this somehow related, let's say, to the square root, uh, like in the Crowver's algorithm or something? Is there any kind of connection? Well, it's definitely related to the Heisenberg limit, mm -hmm. which uh, is somehow also related to Grover, although, I mean, all these relations are not obvious relations that one can see from this uh, on the spot, but uh, so Heisenberg limit is related to Grover because basically is the speed of uh, how quantum states diverge <laughs> under uh, uh, rotations of small angles. In also in Grover is kind of a discretized phase rotation in a, around an unknown axis. So th there is this connection, and uh, so definitely. The quantum advantage that we have here is, uh, is the advantage of the Heisenberg limit compared to the to the to the standard okay. quadratic advantage. Uh, of course, one has to understand what you mean by advantage because um, the classical pro uh, pro uh, programming approach is that you know which unitary you want from the start, and and then of course. I mean, how can you know a real number? I mean, you, you, you have always to, to realize an approximation. The quantum advantage is in a sort of query complexity point of view that somebody gives you exactly the gate you want. So you apply the queries of that gate to a quantum state and you get a program state that gives you the advantage. But of course, if, if you started in the same way that you said started from a classical description of the gate, I wouldn't even call it an advantage because of I course, then you have, like what if you have to build by yourself the gate you I mean you are back to square square one now like how do you realize the gate uh, the, the gate you in the first place I see. okay thank you, uh, thank you. so actually as I understand to, uh, to get this program state you actually it is designed that you have a black box and actually use this uh, schemes for learning and that's how you obtain this uh, program state. Yes, is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how it works, yes? Yes. Okay. In a sense, you say an oracle gives you the program state. You just want this program state to, to reach a certain level of precision. How much dimension needs the oracle to use yeah, to give you this program true. state? If you ask the question, how do you build this program state, starting from a classical description, then we are back to the classical scheme, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, I don't see any. So I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Julia. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for visiting us. See you next Very time. Very nice meeting you, uh, although, uh, although virtually. Hope uh, it will not be too too long before we are yes. in person. Yes, let's hope. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.